Welcome back to Domain 4 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in section 4.7, we'll focus on the importance of automation and orchestration in security operations. We're going to discuss an array of automation use cases from user and group provisioning to ticketing and issue escalation. And we'll explore the operational benefits of orchestration and automation and how they should improve our security posture. And perhaps most importantly, We'll finish our discussion today with a look at the other considerations that can help us to determine not only can we automate, but should we automate for a given scenario. Poor automation decisions bring about bad results, but they do it faster. Lots to cover. Let's dig in. So here we are in the seventh installment of Domain 4, where we're going to focus on automation and orchestration. More specifically, the syllabus asks us to explain the importance of automation and orchestration related to secure operations. And at a high level, the topics in this section are answering three questions. What should you automate? Here are the use cases that are recommended in the Security Plus syllabus. Why should you automate? So the benefits of said automation and orchestration and other considerations when you're deciding how to go about it. But before we get into use cases, I want to unpack the difference between orchestration and automation, just to get you in the right frame of mind for our discussion here. So we'll compare automation and orchestration side by side here. Automation typically involves mechanizing a single process or a few related tasks. Orchestration, on the other hand, manages automated tasks to form complete workflows. Automation aims to reduce manual effort and improve efficiency, where orchestration focuses on enhancing our overall security posture. After all, our focus in the exam is security, right? Security operations, more specifically. So what are some examples of each? Well, automation, we have patch management, scanning for malware and maybe creating a report, resetting user passwords or changing group memberships, fairly targeted, specific, and fairly small tasks. On the orchestration side, we have automating incident response, orchestrating actions across tools in incident response, automating an end-to-end -end security workflow, perhaps touching our identity platform, our firewalls, and our endpoints, all in a single workflow. And if we think about it from a tooling perspective, automation is task level focus, usually single tool, often simple scripts in PowerShell or shell scripts, where orchestration is process focused and coordinating and integrating across tools. The integration may touch our XDR, our firewalls, our endpoints, our SIM system. Often in the context of our conversations here on security, we're talking about security orchestration, automation, and response, or SOAR. Let's get into use cases. The Security Plus syllabus calls out some common use cases for automation and scripting and security operations that benefit most organizations. So they're going to want you to be familiar with the use cases they're calling out in the syllabus. So user and resource provisioning, old school automation, nothing new there. Guardrails, putting some boundaries around our automation. Security groups, nothing exciting here. We're talking about utility functions. Ticket creation and escalation. Now we're getting into areas where we have to respond to issues and incidents. Enabling and disabling services and access. So tightening up our security posture. Continuous integration and testing and integrations and APIs. So now we're talking more about modern automation. But at the end of the day, we expect that we'll be automating common scenarios, actions that need to be repeated over and over again. Actions that, when left to 100% manual effort, result in control gaps in our security. So let's work our way down this list. Automating user provisioning and potentially deprovisioning, so basically handling both ends of the life cycle, ensures that access control is maintained efficiently and securely and consistently. When we make sure the necessary tasks get done and we take the human error out of the equation, we're preventing unauthorized access and maintaining the principle 
of least privilege, one of the tenets of zero trust architecture. And we have resource provisioning. So automation can be used to create, configure, and decommission resources like VMs, our storage, our networks. And here again, it helps maintain a standardized, secure environment while reducing the potential for human error and configuration drift. And guardrails are automated guardrails is what we're talking about here that can enforce security policies and ensure that security best practices are consistently followed. And this is 100% prevalent in the cloud today. We set up policy-based guardrails that prevent admins from deploying virtual machines that are too large, for example from deploying too many of one kind of resource, from deploying resources that don't match our naming conventions or our security settings. But it sets acceptable boundaries that can be enforced without the need for human review. It's not to say on occasion we don't need to deploy a really large VM for a database server, for example, but that's going to go through some sort of exception process. And maybe it still gets deployed out of a CI pipeline from our DevOps organization, but it goes through some exception process. And escalation. Automation can certainly be used to escalate security incidents or events based on the right criteria. We can route to appropriate personnel or teams based on predetermined criteria, improving our response times. Faster response reduces the potential impact of security threats. So ticket creation, automated ticket creation can be used to streamline incident response processes. This is really about routing the response work. We light up the ticket, we assign it to a team, and response is in motion. It ensures that issues are quickly reported and assigned to the appropriate teams for resolution. We can use automation to manage our security groups. It ensures that access controls are consistently applied and updated. And if we automate that task, so it includes situations like when a user changes their job roles, for example, then we can prevent permissions creep, which we often see in situations where folks are managing group memberships manually. We see a user retain all the permissions from their old job, and they're simply granted the new permissions they need for the role they're moving into. And we have enabling or disabling services and access. So whether we're shutting off unneeded services or setting up deny rules on a firewall access list, this helps us maintain a secure environment by limiting unnecessary access and reducing potential attack surfaces. And even in simple scripting scenarios, you'll often see these activities templated. I can write a PowerShell script that accepts parameters. So I can deploy a VM that is a web server versus a VM that is an application server versus a VM that is a database server. Maybe my script uses a different VM template each time. If I'm in the DevOps world, maybe I'm kicking off a pipeline, a CI pipeline with different parameters each time. But it's going to make sure that I have functionally appropriate infrastructure deployed in an automated and consistent and secure way. And then we have continuous integration and testing. But automation is a must for continuous integration and testing processes. It ensures that our code is consistently reviewed, tested, and deployed in a secure manner, which helps prevent the introduction of vulnerabilities into our production environment. So we could spend hours talking about DevOps, DevSecOps, CICD, and increasingly today, we see integrations at the API level. Automations can be used to integrate various security tools and platforms, enabling real-time communication and orchestration. So when we select tools that have standards-based APIs like REST APIs, this ensures interoperability, but it's a feature you should verify before you adopt tools. Make sure you have APIs so when you try to incorporate those tools into your workflows, into your orchestration, they have interfaces that allow you to do so. And if you're using tools like Microsoft's Power Automate or Logic App, or you're using a third party like Zapier, many of these automation and orchestration tools will have pre-created connectors that you can simply light up and put in your credentials or your endpoint, and the integration is more or less free. You just do some simple configuration in their tooling's UI, user interface. And most tools these days are written or created with interoperability in mind, but you need to verify before adoption. 
Let's move on to benefits. So automation and orchestration can deliver several benefits to security operations and the organization on the whole if we make good automation decisions in choosing where we spend our time to automate. It's going to bring benefits in terms of cost to our people, to our security posture. The organization wins in the process. So certainly efficiency and time savings, enforcing our configurations and our baselines, setting ourselves up to scale in a secure manner when we need to scale. We can make things better for our employees and improve our employee retention, improve our reaction time, of course, by automating some of our responses. And it really becomes a workforce multiplier. We'll unpack exactly what is meant by that phrase in a moment. So let's run down the list of benefits. We can gain efficiencies, significantly reduce the time required for various tasks, and automating high-frequency, high-effort tasks allows IT and security teams to focus on more strategic and high-value activities. And really, to gain those efficiencies, you have to know your automation ROI before you build. You need to understand how much time do we spend on activities X, Y, and Z in a given week. So if it takes me a week to automate those tasks, how much time am I going to gain back over the months and years? Automation can help us with consistent enforcement of security baselines and our policies across our organization's infrastructure. It ensures all of our systems and applications are configured in a secure manner and any deviations are quickly addressed. Remember, we talked about configuration enforcement earlier in the series. It should absolutely be automated, templated, through policy, through scripting, through orchestration tools. Standard infrastructure configuration. So automation enables organizations to maintain standard configurations that adhere to security best practices. And this type of automation, which would see frequent reuse, is in and of itself strategic. Infrastructure standards can be as simple as standardizing a VM configuration, but it can certainly get much more complex into standardizing our containerization, for example, how we deploy a Kubernetes cluster as one example. And because this takes more effort, maybe first we focus on some of those high frequency tasks that are lower effort so we can then redirect some of our human resources, some of our team, to these strategic high-value activities. And then there's scaling in a secure manner. So automation allows organizations to scale their operations securely and efficiently. It can ensure that security measures are consistently applied and maintained without the need to grow staff. When we make good automation decisions, when we establish the right priorities, we can do more work with fewer people. Employee retention. So automating repetitive and time-consuming tasks can increase job satisfaction by enabling employees to focus on more engaging and strategic work. It can contribute to higher employee retention rates and a more motivated workforce. I'm a firm believer, and I think evidence shows people enjoy challenging, engaging, strategic, important work over the drudgery of the day-to-day -day utility tasks that we failed to automate. So definitely lots of people benefits we're seeing. We can improve our reaction time. So automation can help improve the organization's reaction time to security incidents and vulnerabilities, even if it's only what we'd call semi-automated. Perhaps we're automating the investigation, but not fully automating the response. But if we're automating half the work that's high effort and frequent, we get a benefit there in reaction time. We can more quickly detect, report, and address issues, minimizing the potential impact and reducing response time. And when done right, automation acts as a workforce multiplier. It allows IT and security teams to manage more systems and processes without the need for additional personnel and without the need for a bunch of overtime. It can result in cost savings for the organization and a more efficient allocation of our resources. These are all the happy, shiny benefits of automation. Now let's look at the other side of the coin and talk about the other considerations. Because automation and orchestration can bring negative consequences to the organization if they don't avoid these pitfalls. And there are several. And these are potential impacts to consider in the envisioning or design phase. 
when we're identifying the processes we wish to automate, when we're selecting the tools that we're going to use to perform that automation. We need to be mindful of complexity. Too much complexity can actually leave us in a situation that is worse than where we start. We can increase our cost, create single points of failure, create technical debt, and ultimately ongoing supportability issues. So avoiding these pitfalls is key to automation that is supportable, maintainable, and cost-effective for the long term. So let's dig in, starting with complexity. So when we implement automation and scripting, it can add complexity to our infrastructure and our processes. We need to ensure that the added complexity is manageable for our people, and it doesn't introduce new vulnerabilities or challenges in the process. When we're choosing tools, we need to make sure we have the skills on staff or on contract who can use the automation and orchestration tools, who can write the scripts. It tends to be a specialized skill set, and this effort of an organization-wide automation and orchestration effort is one that takes months or years in a good size organization. You're not going to wave a magic wand and find a tool that solves all your problems overnight when it comes to process automation. So cost is another concern. When we're out choosing the tools we're going to automate with, it can lead to cost savings in the long run, but the initial investment in tools, infrastructure, and training may be significant. And the organization has to weigh the cost and benefits because subscription automation platforms, for example, can eat into your savings. So we have to weigh the cost and benefits before embarking on an automation project. As many times in the world of automation and orchestration today, we're using cloud-based services, SaaS tools often, and they come at a monthly cost, a subscription cost, where we're paying for what we use. And depending on that subscription billing model, costs can add up. And we can also potentially create single points of failure. So over-reliance on a single automation tool or platform can create a single point of failure in some cases. For example, if we choose a vendor who then goes out of business. What if we're using a cloud automation platform that's a SaaS solution and the company goes out of business overnight? We're now stuck. So we need to make sure that we establish redundancy so we can fall back. We have to keep the trains running. We need to be wary of technical debt. So as tools evolve, there may be a need to update or replace existing scripts and integrations. And this can result in technical debt where outdated or poorly maintained scripts or runbooks cause issues or vulnerabilities. So we need to plan for regular updates or reviews to mitigate our risk. If we maintain a proactive posture, we can keep ahead, a step or two ahead of those maintenance needs so it doesn't pile up and become a great big project. And then ongoing supportability. We need to ensure solutions are maintainable and supportable to deliver long-term success. And this includes training, documentation, monitoring, and updating. We need to consider the resources required to maintain before we start. And before we start is the key phrase, because we don't want to get through a big automation project and then find that we need more people or different people to help us maintain the solution or to operate the solution because then we simply negate, we erase all of those benefits that we just talked about. All right, my friends, that does it for section 4.7. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, drop them in the comments below the video, reach out directly on LinkedIn, happy to help anytime I can. I'll look forward to seeing you back here for section 4.8 in the next day or two. And until next time, take care and stay safe.